Hiya. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show on this. Yeah, it's pretty grey, to be honest. Just went for a run in that. Miserable. Not miserable. It's just the heat wave has well and truly passed. Uh, good to see everyone. Welcome to the show. I know what's going to happen today. A load of people are going to go kicking someone while they're down, having pleasure from the misfortunes of others. And what I'd say is, in this case, yeah, fine, sure. I mean, morally and philosophically, I don't have a problem with that, as long as the person we're talking about, or the people, um, are, are those who are, in this case, trying to throw petrol on a massive culture war with pretty terrible political consequences for all concerned. GB News, that's what I'm talking about. Now, GB News, GB News had delusions of grandeur, and we'll talk about why they were delusions. They came into the boxing match, pumped up, you know, high on the millions of pounds that had been poured into them by investors. They were going to crush the woke left, slam them into oblivion. They were going to take on the BBC, whatever problems I have with the BBC, which we've covered in terms of their uh, political coverage. They thought they were going to take it on. They were going to smash the BBC. They were going to smash Sky News. They were going to be these new coloss this pol this media colossus that would be would dominate all before us. They've they've uh, they've crashed and burned. Essentially, that's what's happened. Now, we, we've got some great guests to talk about. I'm just doing my little preamble, and I'll just explain why, because we've already got some people who are quite angry about me suggesting all is not that well in the GB News world. Now, look, technical hitches happen. Technical hitches happen on this show. They may well happen while we're live. I mean, I don't have several tens of millions of pounds plus hundreds of people working for me, though we do appreciate the support from you uh, which does enable us to hire a team. Let's just have a look quickly at just uh, just to whet your appetite at the sort of technical hitches. Let's have let's have our first just example of the GB News repertoire. And now for those whose favourite thing is the weather, here's the weather. Just say something. Fill the fill the dead air. We shouldn't do any more. No, I'll just do just do one more. Just do one more. Let's just do one. Sturgeon says Scotland is likely to face the same fate. There isn't as longer as Boris Johnson puts it. The many voices out there, Trevor Kavanagh, believe. Are the technical team okay? It's not like someone was been killed off air. Look, technical hitches. Let's, let's not get bogged down in technical hitches. Um, the ratings. Let's talk about the ratings. Because as I said, they really were... This this did... It was reaching for the stars. It was reaching for the stars. Now, don't take my word for it. Let's talk about the... The Daily Express is not, I suppose, known as a woke left publication. GB News viewing figures, week two update as ratings plummet amid establishment rivalry. Let's look at the figures. Let's have a little look, shall we? A little look-see. So BBC 10, uh, News at 10, 3.6 million. BBC News, 1 o'clock, 2.4 million. This is Thursday, by the way, this Thursday. Question time. It's been struggling, people say, but it's still got 1.3 million. Good Morning Britain, 707,000. BBC News, 9 a.m., less than 300,000. BBC News Night, 286,000. Kay Burley on Sky News, flagship presenter, 54,000. The Sky News Ian King Business Programme, 42,000. The Great British Breakfast on GB News, 32,000, which has beaten Andrew Neil, who's on 31,000. And uh, that then follows GB News, De Piero and Halligan, 16,000. GB News, Brazier and Maroki, 11,000. Not, not great, not ideal. I mean, there were several, I'm sure there were people wa watching this with Twitter accounts with more followers than GB News has viewers. So, I mean, if we have an example, the opening night, they did really, they, they were really happy with the opening night figures, GB News. They got 336,000 uh, tuning in, which isn't bad, but you do have to factor in that included me and people like me who are just quite interested in, 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 in watching this new phenomenon, uh, not necessarily with the best interests of the channel at heart, if I'm going to be brutally honest. Um, 333, uh, 336,000. Now, they were very happy with that. The problem with that, I suppose, is that's as good as it was going to get, and that is as good as it got. I mean, as an example, Brazier and Maroki have gone from 36,000 down to 11,000. Uh, the GB News Breakfast Show on the 18th, that's not even that long ago, that's nine days ago, they were on 56,000. They've lost 22,000 viewers since. Now, Andrew Neal, I mean, come on, he's the flagship presenter. 
he founded it and uh, he's taken himself off air after two weeks to take a holiday, apparently. Of course, who doesn't set up an entirely new national television show then abruptly take a holiday two weeks later? It's not, it just hasn't gone well. I mean, let's just be brutally honest. I mean, some would say, well, you're giving it the oxygen. I mean, whatever, fine. I mean, if I've, if I've given it inadvertently a few hundred extra followers, I'm willing to, I'm willing to pay that price. The, the trend is down. I mean, that's the thing, because the other argument would be, I suppose, start with a small base, then go up. But they just, they're just going down. They're declining quite quickly to the point where statistically they're going to end up with shows which just on technically get a zero rate. That means statistically their viewers are so small, they're officially classed as no one watching them. Now, we're going to talk about that. Before, just quickly, we've got a great show today. We're talking about GB News. We're also talking about Matt Hancock, who has resigned not over thousands of elderly patients being discharged uh, without tests into care homes, ending with thousands of them dying. Not over cronies being appointed uh, to public positions. Not over PP failures. I could go through it. No, he's resigned because he got off with someone, had an affair, caught on camera. Slightly dubious the way it's caught camera. We'll talk about that as well. Um, but uh, he did break social distancing rules, which he did uh, technically tell us all to abide by. Uh, nonetheless, what does it say that a man such as this uh, resigns? Because essentially he's a national laughing stock. That's basically why he's resigned. Not over far more severe uh, issues. And we're also going to talk about Batley and Spen. There's a lot going on in the by-election there. And we're later, so we're later joined by the brilliant Ollie Dugmore, who is from joe.co.uk. He's a brilliant journalist, uh, heads their politics and news there, and has done some fantastic coverage. Before I bring in our first two guests, because that's enough for me, just letting the setting out the position with GB News. Um, we do rely on your support because we don't have the multi-millionaire investors that GB News have frittered away, <laughs> have frittered away their cash from GB News. So to do our documentaries, like the one in Batley and Spen or in Hartlepool, or on the businesses that profited from COVID or on the disaster, the COVID catastrophe that the government have unleashed, all the documentaries you've done, you make them happen through patreon.com forward slash ownjones84. We have a team on union wages. No technical hitches so far, either, as you can see. So that's one up from GB News. Um, or you can support the channel by using uh, the uh, super chat. So you can put questions for our guests for that, all, on, that supports them. If you're not watching live on YouTube, because I can see there's a a hefty audience today, but I realize most of you aren't watching this on YouTube. So do click through to YouTube if you're watching this live and that helps support the show. Press like, if you press like, that helps the algorithm. Also press subscribe um, and that will encourage, you will, yeah, like John McKenzie. John McKenzie's a regular, he's from Hong Kong and he's just given us a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, a hundred Hong Kong dollars. So thank you very much. That will support the show and enable us to do those documentaries. Uh, and we'll also read out everybody at the end. Um, but also listen to us on the podcast. Lots of you listen on the podcast for obvious reasons. Do support us on that. Uh, sub uh, again, subscribe, give us five stars. That's enough for me. Let's bring in our two brilliant guests, uh, my longstanding friend and companiero, Ellie Mae Hagen, who is the director of Class, the think tank. Do check out Class. They do fantastic work. And also, we are very lucky to have Leah Watkins, who is a specialist in this entire field of the media. I've interviewed him a lot and uh, always am retweeting his brilliant stuff. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Thanks Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. I was a bit taken off guard then by the sudden like, oh, I need to say hello now. <laughs> Yeah, just some basic professionalism. This isn't GP News, Ellie. Um, so let's just start, Leo, because like um, you're, you know, you're a bit of an expert in this field. So I, what what do you think the function of GP News was, and why isn't it maybe going quite so well? And that is an understatement, as maybe they'd hoped. Well, it's an interesting question because the, the, the thing I keep asking myself about GB News is do they really intend for it to be a profit-making entity in the long run or do they anticipate that it's going to be loss-making for a long time but they think that they can attract enough viewers that they will be able to uh, get more funding from the kinds of people who backed it so far on the basis that they're having some kind of impact. Um, obviously, you know, the primary impact they want is they want people to watch the channel uh, the secondary impact they want is they want to impact the rest of the news agenda. They want, presumably, to continue the decades-long process of driving the British media to the right, 
which the right has been very successful at. I mean, I think the fact that GB News is almost certainly going to fail um, shouldn't obscure the wider fact that the right has for decades been using uh, public policy, media policy and, uh, you know, attacks on the BBC and so on and so forth uh, to effectively reshape the British media away from public service broadcasting uh, and away from uh, trade union um, control, well, not control, but let's say a degree of trade union power in um, broadcast production, for example, um, towards a more neoliberal style of management, of control, and inevitably, therefore, in terms of the values that are informing the output that is produced. Uh, Tom Mills um, has written a book on the BBC, which will give you kind of chapter and verse on that process in the BBC, but it's taken place across the UK media. Um, and GB News, I suppose, is part of that larger project. Um, where I think it, it, it's sort of gone wrong is they seem to think that you can copy the model of Fox News in the UK. I mean, they, they sort of disavow that and, and try and say that what they want to do is, um, is more impartial than Fox News. But if you look really at what they're trying to do, it's essentially an attempt to emulate the Fox News model. And the problem is that Fox News works in the United States for a variety of reasons that don't apply in the UK. Um, the most basic of which is that the United States is an absolutely gigantic media market. And as a result, you can have very niche things that actually like, uh, you know, that can start off fairly niche, but, but then get wider appeal. But they can firstly, like in the beginning, they can have fairly niche appeal and, and, be, and, be, um, and actually be commercially viable. I mean, it's essentially like saying, um, you know, the United States has produces blockbusters, its film industry produces blockbusters. Therefore, we should be able to produce blockbusters in the UK. Well, we can't because the UK's domestic market is too small, really, to uh, fund that kind of production. There simply aren't enough people in our domestic market to fund like $200 million uh, film budgets, which is why we very rarely produce blockbusters in the UK. Um, and, and it's the same with Fox News. I mean, Fox News, uh, you know, it, it has probably about uh, 80 million subscribers, which is a lot, but of course it didn't begin that way. It began very small. It ran at a massive loss for a number of years. Um, and Murdoch had enormous pockets that he could subsidize it with, um, including profits that were derived from The Sun, which was at that point an absolute cash cow. It isn't anymore, it's losing money. But uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s, it was an absolute cash cow for Murdoch. Um, and so he was able to use the profits from his wider media empire to subsidize Fox News, which ran at a loss for a number of years in the 90s, um, until it reached a position where um, it became kind of must-have content. And that brings me on to another factor, which is different about the US market compared to the UK market. It's a slightly technical thing, but I think it's quite interesting. Maybe that's just me. Um, but essentially, the majority of Fox News's revenue doesn't actually come from advertising, whereas GB News is expecting, I think, virtually all of its revenue to come from advertising. Fox News actually generates the majority of its revenue with what's called affiliate fees. Affiliate fees are where, essentially, in the US, people buy cable packages. And a cable package is a bundle of channels that you get if you uh, take out a subscription, which can vary from between $60 to $160 a month, right? Enormous amounts of money. You get a huge number of channels, hundreds and hundreds of channels. Um, and what then happens is the cable provider um, passes on some of that money to the people who produce these channels that they feature. And there's essentially a bargaining relationship between the cable provider and the channel providers. And if the channel is absolutely must have content, if people aren't going to buy a cable package without the channel being in that package, then the channel provider is in an enormously powerful position to charge high affiliate fees. In, a, in other words, like royalties per subscriber. Um, and Fox News basically made itself into must watch content over the course of the 90s and early 2000s, particularly during the Iraq war. That was the point at which it became the top cable news channel in the United States. Uh, it's kind of bellicose coverage of the Iraq War. Um, and, uh, and as a result, it acquired the, the bargaining power with cable operators to uh, charge enormous affiliate fees. Um, and that, so that's the bulk of its revenue. Um, the problem for GB News is they can't really do that in the UK. There's really only one major pay TV provider in that sense that might carry them, um, namely Sky. Um, and it's it's just very hard to see how, I mean, firstly, they're not trying to do that. They're not trying to be a, cha a, a Sky sort of exclusive channel. Um, so they're not going to have affiliate fees. They're only going to have advertising revenue. And news is not very attractive content to advertise next to for all kinds of reasons. Um, 
the final thing I'd say, I realize I've gone along on for a while, but the final thing I'd say, which I think is very important for people to understand is, in the UK, TV news is by and large not made for profit, right? It's not a profitable activity. Everyone who does it, does it either in some sense because they're required to. The ex only exception really is Sky. In the case of the BBC and Channel 4, it's in their remits as public broadcasters that they must produce news. In the case of ITV and Channel 5, they have quotas that they're required to fill in order uh, to get their Channel 3 and Channel 5 licenses uh, from Ofcom uh, for a certain amount of peak uh, news programming, that is, that is to say news programming in peak times, um, uh, each year. And uh, the programs that these, uh, news programs that these uh, entities make um, are essentially subsidized in the case of the commercial broadcasters by advertising revenue generated by other programs, right? Um, so uh, for virtually everyone, it's, it's, it's lot, in fact, for everyone, it's loss making. Sky News um, is not something that Sky is required to produce, but which Sky has deemed in its interest to produce for reasons of basically marketing and kind of broader brand benefits. But again, it subsidizes Sky News to the tune of millions of pounds a year. It's not profit making. Um, and, you know, so that has to be borne in mind. You know, the BBC and the BBC News Channel and Sky News Channel um, both have substantially more viewers than GB News, and they're both loss making. I mean, obviously, the BBC doesn't carry advertising, um, but Sky News is the relevant comparison, and Sky News has always been loss making. There's absolutely no evidence in the history of UK broadcasting to suggest that you can make a news channel that is profitable, which is one reason why nobody has done it by now. Um, and the only people who are doing it are a bunch of right wing ideologues who apparently seem to know nothing about broadcast economics. I mean, on that, Ellie, you've got, I think, a very interesting theory about why it's perhaps not been the success they desired, which is they don't really understand their audience. Yeah, but I think, first of all, I kind of, I guess I want to sound a note of caution, which is that I'm not sure that we can, like, call death on GB News just yet, because, you know, there might be there might be a moment where they suddenly catch the zeitgeist, you know, like it, like Fox News did with the Iraq war or they sort of capture a particular audience. And there might be, you know, maybe they'll do a really high profile interview that will for some reason go viral and then more people will, will kind of pay attention. You know, so we don't know that yet. But I think, um, yeah, I think one of the mistakes that they've made is that they focus quite a lot on anti lockdown stuff. But at the same time, it's clear that their target audience are like kind of Britain's angry boomers. But Britain's angry boomers, while they might be reactionary in, you know, as a as a demographic in in on many issues, when it comes to lockdown, they are most in support of lockdown of any other demographic in this country. And that's because they're pensioners, so they don't their impact on, on their income isn't there isn't one and you know they own their own homes many of them so there's no worry there about like a lot of boomers by now own their homes outright so there's no worry there about you know what will happen to being able to pay the rent and the bills and that kind of thing and of course they're the most vulnerable to the virus so when you've got you know the sort of ex showbiz columnist of the sun trying his hand at epidemiology and saying that we should just end the lockdown, you know, not that there is even a lockdown now, you're actually appealing to a, a tiny uh, proportion of the population and you're saying things that your audience that you're targeting doesn't agree with. So I think that's been a huge uh, mistake on their part. But I also think there's a sort of more general mundane reasons why it's not been this big explosion. And that's that rolling news just doesn't get that many viewers anyway. Like, you know, in your figures there, you show that the most popular person on Sky News, Kate Burley, Kay Burley, sorry, who I really enjoy watching Kay Burley, but she, Same. she only, yeah, she only got 54,000 viewers. It's not that much, but you know, um, as Leah was saying, it doesn't really matter that much for Sky because I think I think Sky News for the Sky sort of empire, if you like, is um, is more of a kind of brand building exercise. So like Sky News is the free channel and it's kind of like your gateway drug into Sky in general. It sort of gives the brand a kind of prestige and I think that's what it's there for rather than for making money. 
Um, and then the other thing is, I think that GB News has really overestimated the uh, importance and the, the sort of value people place on punditry. Like, you know, people watch Sky because, like, they'll flick onto it because they quickly want to see what's happening in the world. And, like, BBC One at 10 is like a titan of news in this country. And people watch it not because they want to see people fighting with each other or, like, see some co commentators saying what they think. It's because they actually want to know what's going on in the world. And I think most people are just quite happy to kind of get the news, hear a sort of summary shot of, like, this is what happened today, and then kind of get on with their lives. I don't think that many people in this country really want to sit and listen to people sort of dissecting the news from quite a singular viewpoint for hours. And I think when you add the bad production values into that, I mean, honestly, sometimes it looks like a kind of hostage video that's being sent, you know, from like a kind of basement somewhere. You know, it just, it like genuinely makes it hard to watch. It's like uncomfortable to watch because it's sort of, you know, it makes you feel uncomfortable because it's a bit embarrassing. Um, and it's just like, it's also just difficult to watch, you know, when, when the presenters aren't quite sure what's going on. And, you know, you kind of want like, really good presenters like Kay Burley, you know, you don't have to like her or agree with her, but she's really good at guiding the viewer through the segment, making you feel like you can just sit back and let her take you through what she's doing. You know, she's really good at that. But when you've got presenters basically being like, what's next? I don't know. It's sort of quite difficult for you to really follow it. And so I think, you know, all of these things together have contributed towards uh, people just kind of checking it out because they want to see what's going on and then just kind of switching off and going back to the BBC. Um, but yeah, like I say, I don't want to like say it's over just yet because, you know, you never know, do you, with these things. Like, I think we've seen the sudden revival or sort of sudden uh, popularity of certain kind of YouTube channels or YouTube figures or kind of TV programs where they've suddenly managed to capture the zeitgeist and then they attract a new audience. So mm -hmm. I do think that could happen, but I, do, I think there's like quite clear, obvious reasons why I think the people who founded GB News have maybe overestimated the appetite for it basically. And then the bad production values definitely makes it harder to watch. So. I mean, I think it's it. By the way, uh, lots of people found the hostage video comment pretty amusing. Just had a good <laughs> glance. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think it's interesting that, I mean, this is almost this kind of delusional self presentation that has kind of defined a lot of Brit political discourse over the last few years, which is basically this cosmopolitan, middle class, privileged elite, which is speaking down to. Uh, working class people whose values are being trashed. Because actually, if you look at the audience of GB News, um, and social classification, the way Pulse is used, it's quite problematic. For those who don't know, they use ABC1, that's supposed to be middle class, and C2DE, which is supposed to be working class. But I mean, it's problematic for lots of ways, but we'll just go with it because that's what pollsters do. But over 80% of GB News' audience are ABC1, which does suggest a very high pr uh, preponderance of pretty well off, they're older, the overwhelmingly older affluent viewers who quite like the idea that they are the downtrodden masses against the establishment. But Lee, I do think what, what Ellie's pointing out, I do think is partly alluded to, and, and I think it is important because this sort of video, when GB News is a huge triumph of success, people go, ha ha, this video, what you said has been proven wrong. But I mean, just do you not think a lot of this basically is Twitter beef has given has basically rotted people's brains because on Twitter, there is a big audience. If you want to go and bash woke and all the rest of it, you'll get a lot of retweets, you'll get a lot of likes, you get, uh, but actually most people don't really care. I mean, the polling bears this out because most people don't even know what woke means. That's what the polling has consistently shown. And, and actually a lot of this is trying to turn the obsessions of Twitter, which isn't where most people are anyway, into a national television station. And partly, I mean, whenever I go on the TV, when I go on BBC or Sky, I'll get my mentions will be flooded with no to Islam, no, de you know, death to PC uh, kind of people who look, and they obviously love to hate watching me. Like they're tuning in and they, they hate me, but they quite enjoy hating me. And what I'm trying to say is actually the problem with GB News is 
That's not entertaining because they're just watching people confirm their prejudices and their and, and, and so on. But there's quite a small subset who have those obsessions and actually they don't maybe enjoy watching their own echo chamber. Leo, sorry. Um, I see what you're saying. I mean, there are two things I would say. The first is, I think one has to come back to the example of Fox News. I think Fox News is what's rotted their brain because they looked at Fox News and thought we can do that in the UK. And it's part of a wider pathology on the um, on the British right, which is to believe that basically America is better than the UK in virtually every respect, and that what we need to do is emulate America across the board, or become closer to America diplomatically, politically, economically, whatever. Um, and that the enormous success of the American right in terms of the culture war, discourse, Trump, you know, the domination of Fox News in American news media means that it must there must be a successful model there in just having lots of right-wing people um, being very shouty and opinionated uh, on a 24-hour news channel, that that can just be straightforwardly replicated in the UK. And what they betray in, in um, thinking that is their own total incomprehension of the specifics of how particular markets work. These are people who are ideologues of the free market in general, but have absolutely no understanding of how particular markets work, including the markets that they themselves have been based in. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's really key. Like, the, 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 as I said before, the UK and US broadcasting markets are totally different and you can't simply transpose the Fox News model over the UK. But I think the second thing I would say, I mean, but also incidentally on Fox News, Fox News is actually quite well made at a technical level, right? Um, it's very entertaining to watch. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is they spend way more on their, um, uh, on, on production than GB News does, because there's a much larger American market, right? They can finance that because there's a far larger American market for that kind of content, because of the sheer size of the country. Um, and, and the second thing, of course, is that they're not bound by broadcasting regulation, so they're free to be as biased or as inaccurate as they want. They're free to play to their audience's prejudices and fantasies far more than GB News is. I think broadcasting regulation is not as much of a constraint as it's often made out to be, but it is still a constraint in some respects. And then there's also the fact that advertising regulation is far looser in America. You can show way more ads per hour. And of course, there's also political advertising in the United States, which is a huge money spinner for American TV. It, in the last election cycle, it was about $8 billion worth of revenue. Um, there's no equivalent to that in the UK because political, paid political advertising is banned on television much as it should be online, but isn't actually at the moment. Um, so there are those factors as well as to why it can't be copied over. But also I would say on Twitter, the thing is TV, like live TV viewing is in decline, actually quite rapid decline. The decline is faster. It's like going down much quicker amongst younger age groups. Um, older age groups still watch TV, but their viewing is in decline. So for example, I had a look earlier and saw that amongst 45 to 54 year olds, the average amount of live TV viewing per day fell between 2010 and 19 from four and a half hours to three hours 20. Um, amongst 16 to 24s, it's completely collapsed. Um, they basically don't watch live TV anymore. Um, but amongst over 75s, they do still watch a lot of live TV. And so GB News, if it makes any sense as a proposition, only makes sense as one which is largely targeted at older people um, who are pretty much the only people who watch large amounts of live TV anymore. Um, and I think that, you know, one, one reason why people don't watch much live TV anymore is firstly, they watch streaming or whatever, but also they spend more time on things like social media, which, you know, didn't exist to anything like the same degree, even 10 years ago, let alone 15 or 20. So there's a sense in which one of the problems for GB News is that they're trying to sort of, in a sense, turn the clock back. Um, what's happened really is that a lot of ultra right wing people have you know taken their right-wing views and sort of um, engaged in the kind of online I don't know what to describe it you know the kind of far more participatory spectacle of Twitter than the kind of passive spectacle of um, TV news uh, that's really the trend in a sense it's towards social media uh, not away from it and so trying to sort of take the kind of attitudes and mindsets that have developed on social media and get people to watch a TV channel based on them is, as I say, it's, it's like turning, trying to turn the clock back. Ellie, before, I just want to ask quickly, because I'm going to ask one more final question to Leah before we let him go and then bring in Ollie to talk about Matt Hancock. 
Um, I mean, so D3 Willow says, great point by Ellie. GB News will get more traction when it speaks to its base properly. Wait till they get the more panicked and crusades rolling against youths and immigrants. But John McKenzie, for example, says... Um, has GB News failed because people have had enough of hate-filled news? I suppose what I'm asking, I mean, it, it, it's partly what I asked before. I mean, the, yesterday there was a big trans pride demonstration in London, which was well received by local people who were just in the in out and about in town. And, and the reason I say that is if you read the national newspaper from liberal to conservative, there's a moral panic about trans people, which is constant and never-ending and relentless. But actually the polling shows, if you compare the polling to... In 1988, the British Social Attitude Survey showed well over two thirds of the population had very negative. Well, they thought homosexuality was always, always or mostly wrong, and about 12% thought it wasn't. Um, but actually, polling on trans rights, most people don't think about trans rights, just not on their agenda. But if they do, actually, they're not generally that negative at all. Um, so I suppose, you know, and when you've got a channel which is, oh, going to self ID as a toaster, I mean, it doesn't, does it maybe not? Do you think it just doesn't have, you know, those obsessions are relatively niche? If you, that's really your big cause, and maybe, but maybe as someone else suggests, actually, when they really get going, things will change. Yeah, I think. I mean, on trans rights in particular, there's a there's research that shows that the principle, and you know, I don't, we don't really need research to tell you this, but the principle of live and let live is quite important to to British people and I think that is to most British people and I think that is uh, you know that is the sort of basis upon which most people uh, respond to uh, trans people I'm not saying that they don't say things that are ignorant I'm not saying that they use the right terminology and, and might not or might use the right pronouns um, but the the basic principle of live and let live I think is something that people sort of believe in and, and I'm perhaps slightly perplexed by this sort of media uh, hysteria about it. Um, I also think, I also really hate the way that uh, the right constantly uses trans rights as a, a talking point, as though, you know, a, a sort of a group of human beings as a weapon in a debate is just gross. Um, but I actually think what you said earlier about Twitter melting people's brains, I mean, I, I think this very strongly anyway uh, about Twitter. I think particularly on the left, I think it, we, it was not a good idea for us to have that as our platform of choice, particularly when we uh, keep using our inside voices outside on it um, and, and sort of perpetually beefing with one another, I think has not been great. But I do think that... Um, in some ways, this is sort of a Twitter transformed into uh, a news station, and perhaps uh, GB News have overestimated uh, the extent of interest out there um, based on quite coordinated uh, sort of moments on Twitter of people who have particularly politi like particular political opinions has perhaps made them think there's a bigger appetite out there for sort of viewpoints and arguments that maybe there isn't. Hmm. I mean, I, what, for me, one interesting thing that happened in the last week was that bloke from uh, Mumford and Sons who resigned from his like amazing career as a rock star where no doubt he was worshipped by thousands of fans because essentially because he trended on Twitter in a negative way and now he wants to tweet more. I mean, that to me was somebody who really has got what I believe is known as poster's brain and just needs to step away from the computer. And I think maybe this is the sort of news version of that, that actually, like I said earlier, there's no news on GB News. It's just punditry. Hmm. People are not that into punditry. Um, they, they watch news because they want to know what's going on in the world primarily. And occasionally they want someone to explain complex stuff to them so that they don't have to spend ages thinking about it. But I think in general, the appetite for punditry is really small, like as in sol solely punditry, is like, is really small, which is why actually people are constantly saying anyway that Twitter is a bubble, because it is, because most people aren't spending their time doing that. So I think always the, the sort of, the reach that this was going to have was always going to be, it was going to be quite specialist. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's what we're seeing. I, but, yeah, you know, as I said before, they could, like, turn it around. They could change up a little bit and, um, and like, you know, 
do better camera work, whatever, and they might they might kind of get better. But yeah, as Leo was saying, I mean, like Fox News is entertaining. Like the the presenters all know exactly what they're doing. They're sleek. They're charismatic. Um, and it has actual news. That's the big difference. There's actual news on Fox News. There's no news on GB News, you know, apart from the ticker at the bottom. So, yeah, it's. I just think, you know, a lot of people who are used to being pundits themselves, you probably receive a lot of feedback all the time from sort of self-selecting audience members who have thought, oh, there's a real big appetite for this out there. And America's doing it and they're doing really well, so let's do it as well. And I think actually maybe they are coming into contact with the reality of it, which is that most people are just kind of getting on with their lives and they don't want eight hours a day of punditry. So just quickly, Leah, because I need to bring in Ollie Dugmore and talk about Matt Hancock and Batman's Ben. Just quickly, um, and by the way, no one's listened to Mumford and Sons for seven years anyway, but just, just I quickly. I have never listened to a Mumford and Sons song. This is what I realised when all of this, I'd never heard them before. This quite, they were actually, very good. I did listen to one. I didn't like it. There was one song I actually quite liked, which is a bit embarrassing, but anyway. Uh, just quickly, Leo, um, Gabrielle asked why someone like Andrew Neil did not know about the broadcast economics that you were talking about. How can someone so experienced have got involved in something so poorly thought out? Just finally, just on that, and, and just where do you think the future... I can't, I just said a quick question. In terms of what this all says about the media ecosystem, Channel 4 being privatised, rah, 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 we can be all smug as we want about GB News, but it's a hostile, grim environment out there for people on the left, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, on the point about Andrew Neil, I mean, Andrew Neil was editor of the Sunday Times for a long time. Uh, then he went to the BBC. Well, that might have been a period of Sky, actually, but um, then he went to the BBC. Um, and so, in a sense, you know, I could play devil's advocate and say, and, and adopt a sort of right-wing position and say, well, he's never really been subject to the true discipline of market forces because his salary has been paid by the taxpayer for the last however many years, right? Um, and just because you make uh, something doesn't actually mean you know how to sell it or what the market for it is. A, a good advert for that is how totally ineptly the entire UK press responded to the rise of the internet um, and how totally they failed to make sustainable digital businesses on it um, and until very recently in some cases, I think, um, and in some cases still not at all. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, just because they're in the industry doesn't mean they actually know that much about, about broadcast economics. On the wider point about um, the future of media, as I said at the beginning, the right has been waging a very effective struggle to reshape the media uh, in direction suitable to it for at least the last 40 years. Mm. Um, almost every major media policy decision in the UK over the last 40 years, especially when it comes to broadcasting, has been taken by the Conservatives. The Labour Party has been completely absent. Um, the Labour Party, with the only exception of like two people, namely Charlie Faulkner and Ed Miliband, did nothing to try and stop Rupert Murdoch uh, buying Sky in 2016-17. Um, sorry, 17-18. Um, and, you know, they just continually failed to, to, you know, do anything to challenge the rights hegemony there. Um, I think there's also the other problem that, you know, the right just has lots and lots of money. Like, GP News has got £60 million of investment in it, which, you know, is going to be pissed up the wall, it looks like. Um, but £60 million would be an enormous investment in left media terms. If you look at entities like, you know, well, this show or Navara or, you know, Tribune or whoever, or New Socialist or whoever it is, right, they run on absolutely shoestring budgets. They do very well considering how little money they run on because essentially the people involved in them are doing it, you know, not for the money. Uh, and they're certainly not being paid the, anything like the kinds of salaries that the people at GB News are probably getting. Um, and But what that highlights is the right can chuck £60 million at a completely stupid idea and not really think a great deal about it because they have so much money, right? If that fails, they'll just come back again and again in different guises. We know that Murdoch was considering launching his own uh, news channel as well, but aborted that effort, I think perhaps because they thought that with two, they were even more likely to fail, you know, with competition from GB News. So they're probably going to wait and see what GB News does first before they decide to do anything. But it is also worth remembering, the right has had lots of attempts to do things in the media space that have failed. Does anyone, for example, remember Heat Street with Louise Mensch? That was a website launched I by... I do! Yeah. I do remember it! Yeah, exactly. Or there was Rupert Murdoch's uh, iPad newspaper, The Daily, that was launched in like 2011 and folded within about a year and a half. Then there was Murdoch's attempt to try and get into the education market and sell 
children, well, actually to sell schools, tablets loaded with textbooks created by News Corp uh, called Amplify. That completely failed in the United States. There was his attempt, two attempts to buy Sky. Those completely failed. There was his attempt to buy HBO and Time Warner. That also failed. They do lots of these things, and lots of them fail. We shouldn't assume that everything the right does in the media sphere fails. The problem, really, is that over the last 40 years, they've done enormous harm to British broadcasting yeah. in all kinds of ways. And the latest episode of that is the Channel 4 privatization, which has absolutely no sense. And the last thing I'll say on that is the Labour Party could and should be very strongly opposed to that measure because Channel 4 is a relatively successful example of public ownership that the public likes, that occupies a distinctive position in the UK's media ecology that would not be replicated by a commercial provider because Channel 4's remit is to do things that the market wouldn't otherwise do. Um, and the Labour Party could adopt a very simple position on this. It could say, we're going to put a small tax on advertising in the UK. Aver average annual advertising spending in the UK is about 25, 26 billion dollar, um, sorry, pounds a year. So you could put a 5% tax on that. You could raise something like 1.2 billion in revenue a year, and that would be the equivalent of about double Channel 4's current programming budget. You could give that money to Channel 4. Channel 4 would have no need to run adverts in the future, and it could be available you know, for free across all platforms. And, and so if Channel 4 would have a secure digital future on the basis of a relatively small tax on advertising that would enable it to stay as a publicly owned thing. In fact, it would make it better because there'd be no advertising on it anymore and it wouldn't have to make programs in order to generate advertising, which is a sort of an impulse that generally leads, leads broadcasters you know, in trivial directions. Um, so you know, there's a simple policy that Labour could lay out in opposition to the Tories here, but I bet you they won't <laughs> because the Labour Party has been absolutely terrible on media policy pretty much for its entire existence. Um, and the only thing that's changed is whether it has, you know, said nothing or actually done things to make things worse, which is what happened under Blair. But, um, you know, th that's that's the situation. We have to change that. And we also need the wider left to appreciate the importance of funding media, which is clearly something the right understands, even if often what they do is is bet on complete turkeys like GB News. Amen. Uh, that was brilliant, Leo. Thank you so, so much uh, for a real comprehensive, I think, analysis. And that's what's really important. We've not just, we started by ridiculing GB News, but we have actually had a very thorough analysis of what it actually represents and why it's all gone so wrong, but why also there is a lot of caveats. So, Leo, thank you so, so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to keep Ellie because we're going to bring in Ollie now. Ollie, so sorry to keep you waiting there. Whoops, sorry about that. Ollie, come on in. Ollie, sorry, you've been sitting there so patiently. And we said about half past, that did not happen. Uh, so huge apologies. Ollie, the great Ollie Dugmore, who runs news and politics at joe.co.uk, does brilliant videos. Do check him out. Do check him out. It's, it's astonishing behaviour. Check him out. Check yeah. him out. Check him yeah. out. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so let's talk about Matt Hancock. So Matt Hancock uh, was the Secretary for Health and um, a video came out of him and his aide and university friend who was appointed to a public position um, just really just getting off in quite an aggressive way, I would say, on public property. We're not going to show you the video, including the video which has Alan Partridge dubbing over it because we decided it would be too traumatizing for people but i just want to show you just quickly what tory uh yeah what the brand what brandon lewis the tory cabinet minister had to say about it position was untenable and distracting from the wider work that we've all got to do to move forward in the pandemic and out of the pandemic there's there's no getting away from that and i think that's why matt ultimately made a decision he did as i say i think in doing that he has put his family and indeed all of us across the UK first because he wants to focus, as the PM does, as we all do, to be on getting out. He put his family first. <laughs> Sorry, there's just something very funny about that. Tory cabinet minister said that Matt Hancock has decided to put his family first after getting... Anyway, um, Ollie, I mean, what do you think it says about British politics that he's, he, this is the one thing Matt Hancock in the end had to resign over? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's damning, uh, and also just like quite upsetting. I mean, there's so, there's so many different angles here, but the first thing for me, bizarrely, I don't know whether you felt the same way, Owen, but the first thing I actually thought of when I saw that photo, and I was up early because I was going to Batley, and I saw it about four in the morning, and I thought of I thought of his family. I thought of I did actually think of his family. I thought of his wife. I thought of his kids. Like the way you find out about that is like a picture of him on the front page. It's like that's grim for them but 
you know, to move away from that and talk about the broader political picture, I mean, it's got, I think it's actually quite extraordinary that he's gone because if you look at the prime minister, I mean, he's not exactly a shining example of the nuclear family or traditional family values. Um, uh, but it's what did him for Hancock. And I guess also that Johnson didn't sack him. I mean, how could he? Uh, Hancock went himself, which I guess it kind of maybe does speak to a slither of character that he has. Um, but yeah, it's brutal. Look, you're, we're, we've been locked up and pe people, people my age have been foregoing forming relationships, having sex with other people uh, because they were interested in protecting the lives of the other people in this country. They put the public before themselves, yeah. um, as well as all the other ways that young people have been affected by this pandemic, you know, much greater wage insecurity, um, live in shared rented accommodation, so they can't take a mortgage holiday, uh, don't have a garden. So if you want to go outside, you've got to go to a park and the Daily Mail will scream at you for doing so. And even outside of that, let's, let's make it not about sex. Let's make it about the people who weren't able to attend the funerals of their loved ones, couldn't hug their gran. You know, I, I know, I know people whose grandparents have died during this pandemic that they weren't able to see for the year before they passed away. Imagine the trauma of the person who has that relationship or the trauma for the elderly person who quite often doesn't actually know, can't understand why they can't touch their loved one. And you've got him there. I, I don't know how to describe it other than basically like a sixth form or maybe even like a year seven, year eight disco kind of necking, like the, like the ass grab. It just, oh yeah. Like it's making me shiver and you see the video of it and it's just like, I, how dare you, you know, how dare well, you. Ollie, we didn't put that video on for a reason, just fair. <laughs> Don't it. describe it, it in such graphic detail. You describe it in such vivid detail. We might as well have just... Sorry, put might as well roll the clip. If you haven't watched it, don't. Just don't. It's one of those things no. where people think to themselves, well, I might as well ju just don't watch it. So there's nothing to be gained. Ellie, what's your... T I mean, what do you... Th I mean, because actually, yeah, I mean, given Jennifer O'Curry, who uh, Boris Johnson had an affair with, I normally say alleged, but actually she just said that he had an affair with her. I doubt Boris Johnson will go through the trouble of suing me over it. Um, and she was obviously... Uh, got public money, all the rest of it. So you couldn't really... Sacker, but they they basically got away with not resigning or being sacked over anything. So, what do you think? What do you think this all tells us about British politics? I mean, I think the first thing to say is I don't find it that surprising that he resigned over this and not over, for example, allowing people with COVID to go back into care homes, um, because for him to resign over that would involve admitting that it had happened. And I just don't think he or anyone in the government is willing to admit to the extent of their negligence, because if they did, it would be, you know, it would mean that they were basically unfit to govern. So it doesn't surprise me that they won't, that they don't want him to resign over those things that, that, because they don't want to take responsibility for them, basically. But, you know, what I think about this is, I mean, it's quite similar to what Ollie said, that I thought in March 2020 that we made a deal with the government, by we I mean the British public. I thought that we said, okay, we're going to give up our lives for three months. Maybe some of us will die and our loved ones won't get to say goodbye to us. Maybe like we won't be able to form relationships. Maybe we'll struggle to pay the bills because we won't be able to work. And we're going to do all of that for three months. We're going to put everything on hold. Because in return, you are going to get a world-beating track and trace system set up. You are going to um, help people self-isolate so that they don't spread the virus. You are going to help people who are coming into this country quarantine properly so that they don't import take variants in with them. And you're going to drive cases down really low so that we can open up again, feeling safe and waiting for a vaccine. That is what I thought the the deal that we made was, and that was what Boris Johnson, when he said, um, said when he promised that we would turn the tide in 12 weeks. And, you know, we are where we are. I mean, we had a terrible second wave in winter where, you know, thousands and thousands of people unnecessarily died. We may be going into a third wave now. We don't have a, a test and trace system. Um, we don't have a quarantine for those who need it. You know, class has done some research and we found that nearly half of people in this country say they can't afford to self-isolate if they needed to. So basically, you know, and this is what they were getting up to in that three months where they were supposed to be holding their end of the bargain up as he was sort of getting off with an aid. 
Um, and also, you know, what like because it was scoring points with the Labour Party during that time. You know, instead of actually holding up the end of the deal that we struck with them, which was a pretty serious deal, you know, it involved a lot of sacrifices. And I think that people in general in this country overwhelmingly stuck to their side of things. Mm. And actually the government has like let everybody down. And I think it's this perpetual thing with this government uh, of do what we say and not what we do. Right. Um, that I think people have started to find intolerable. And in the end, I think that's what did it for him. And I'm not, you know, I, I wish that he had gone over the care home scandal hmm. um, and the numerous other failures of uh, his time at health secretary. But I am glad that he's gone for something. Just lastly, um, because I want to talk to Ollie just about Batley, because like myself, he's gone up to Batley with Ben. Um, Keir Starmer. Now, Keir Starmer yesterday was like, rah, 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 he resigned, he should have been sacked. Now, Keir Starmer, look, we've got a tweet, I think, from, uh, yeah, Keir, see Keir Starmer, this is from February, says he will not be calling for Matt Hancock to resign over the unlawful publishing of COVID contracts, saying, people, saying calling for people to resign is not what the public really want to see. I mean, literally just refused time and time again to call for Matt Hancock or anybody to resign. And then we see a picture of a, a, a video of, as Ollie so vividly put it, basically them necking like a couple of 13 year olds at a school disco. <laughs> um, and then Keir Starmer's like, yes, resign. Yeah, oh, well, I'm glad he resigned. I mean, I, I mean, again, it's just not not great opposition, is it, Ollie? What do you think? I, I think, uh, well, I'm, we're almost certainly going to touch on this when we come to talking about Batley in a moment anyway. Um, but it's 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 anonymous, basically. Um, I like don't get me wrong. I'm not pretending to be some kind of like Svengali Machiavel who can, who knows how to how to like run media strategy for the leader of the opposition. But I would think that you would kind of want to be out and about in a time like this, um, potentially, you know, suggesting that the government aren't up to the job, that the 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 rife double standards that exist across, you know, talk about Neil Ferguson, you know. Um, the professor lockdown, you know, and the way that that was handled, resign immediately, et cetera, et cetera. And the way that other people have been allowed to get away with all sorts of things. Pretty Patel and the bullying allegations, the report into her, what that found, she's still in post. Um, I would like to see the leader of the opposition, you know, causing a bit of a fuss about this, but I think potentially in the context of the wider, the wider picture, again, Batley and Spen and, and Keir Starmer's leadership, Maybe it's a case of damage limitation or kind of accepting that the game is up. Who knows? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what, what do you think, Ellie? Just just quickly, because I realise we're now just going to overrun. Um, what do you think, the whole thing? I think what I find frustrating is, you know, if you look at, like, two successful Labour politicians, um, Andy Burnham and uh, Mark Drakeford, Mick Drakeford, and I mean this no disrespect towards either of them, because I think they are great performers, but actually what they've kind of offered has not really been that much. I mean, I know they've got the advantage of already being in post, but, you know, um, Andy Burnham has picked some fights with the government and he's talked about nationalising uh, Manchester's bus network. Uh, uh, Mark Drakeford has basically made it clear to Welsh people that he'd rather they didn't die in the pandemic. You know, and Wales is doing some other interesting things like it's trialling a universal basic income and that kind of thing. But it's not exactly like, you know, Nye Bevan levels. It's not uh, bringing about socialist, a socialist settlement in the places that they govern. You know, it's still quite modest things. And yet they've, they've been rewarded. You know, Mark Drakeford's been very handsomely rewarded in the local elections by voters. And, you know, Andy Burnham is king of the north. He's like super popular. So I feel like in, in some ways, I, I, I know that the leader of the opposition is a terrible job. I know that, you know, we saw it in the last four years. I can see it with Keir Starmer now. It's, it's, it's a hard job. But I also think, you know, you don't, do you have to do that much? You know, I mean, it, it feels like even the bare minimum is not being done by Labour. Um, and that's just incredibly frustrating because I think there are just so many open goals uh, that they are not even, you know, tapping it in. And it's just, that's really frustrating to see. And I think, you, you know, you're going to talk about this in a bit, but I think like someone like Kim Kim Ledbetter, who is, or Ledbeater, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say her surname. Ledbeater. Who, Ledbeater, who is actually a really good candidate, you know. I mean, 
you like you you could have argued that there was something a little bit perhaps um symbolic just symbolic only about her t taking over her sister's seat but i think she's defied that and like really worked hard for that seat and i think it's unfortunate that you know she's doing this with a party that hasn't really given any uh persuasive reasons for you to vote for it and i think if she doesn't win that will be a huge shame for her and for batley and spen and i think it's because the, the opposition just isn't able to pick fights and isn't able to kind of set its stall out and that's that's really frustrating and i think uh politicians like mark drakeford and andy burnham show that actually it is possible to do that and be successful ellie you are an absolute legend thank you so much for joining us i will see you soon i'll get you a drink or something so thanks Lots of love. Have a good day. I'll see, I'll, see, I'll see you in a bit. Lots of love. That was great, Ellie, as ever, as per. <laughs> um, Ollie, let's talk about Batley and Spen. Um, I'm sorry mm. we're overrunning, taking your valuable time. Um, um, so we've both been to, we've both been up um, to Batley and Spen because there is a by-election coming up this Thursday, unless people are listening to this after the event. Uh, it's happening this Thursday. It is a seat which Labour has held for a long time. Uh, in 2019, Labour kept it with a 3,500 majority or so, just by a national electoral inferno. In 2017, actually, it was over half the electorate voted for Labour in Batley and Spen, over 8,000 people. Um, Labour are panicking. They think they're going to lose the seat. And uh, they thought they were already worried about it already. But George Galloway threw his hat in the ring um, Batley and Spen has a large Muslim population. 86% of British Muslims voted for the Labour Party in 2019. There are over 3 million Muslims in Britain, and they are a core pillar of Labour's electoral coalition. Now, let's just talk about what happened, because you were there this day. I wasn't there this day. And this is a confrontation. We've got a clip here from your clip, so don't, like, sue us or something. I don't know. What. <laughs> Unlikely, gonna, I think. Just going to use... We're going to now use a clip. And this is a clip of Kim... Leadbeater being uh, heckled by, and we'll explain who, who she's being heckled by, but here's the clip. Members of Parliament who have why, forced why that LGBT indoctrination to children, why what do you, you feel? How do you feel about Muslim parents who don't shout? want their children to learn? Because I'm very angry. I'm why very upset. Why would you do that? Why would you shout at me? 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 Muslim parents who don't want their children to learn about sensitive sexual relationships. Are you going to stand for those Muslim parents? Do you know what? I'm not going to stand. You shouting at me. An innocent yours. woman who has put herself forward with a little lie. No one's going to interrupt you. Know, you know. This is where I live. This is my community. Don't come here and shout at me in the street. The Muslim community of Batley and Spen deserve, deserve better than much this. Better. They deserve better than no, this. We're, we're, we're the community. I'm asking you, are you going to support Muslim parents? I uh, I thought Kim dealt with that really well, by the way. I actually know. So I we both know. I know who that guy is. Uh, I've interviewed him myself. He's a guy called Shaquille Afsar, who is from Birmingham. He's not from Batley. And he led the anti-LGBTQ uh, protest, sorry, against LGBTQ inclusive education in schools. Just quickly, here's a clip of me interviewing him two years ago. So what's wrong with telling children that gay people exist? Because they will come across, they well, will encounter well, gay people. According to, according, to, according to the parents, they're saying that why would you be pushing a moral way of thinking that's different to the moral way of thinking of that child's household? But if there's two men holding hands, you must respect them. That doesn't mean that you have to adhere to that way of thinking. But that's not what they're being taught. They're not being taught they have to adhere to that. They're just mm -hmm. saying that gay people exist and to educate them about their well, existence. According, according to the parents, it's being over-promoted. But anyway, he was talking nonsense, by the way. These schools, education, it's inclusive. It shows, like, some kids have a mixed-race parent, some have two dads or two mums. Anyway, um, the point, that the reason I'm asking to talk about this, Ollie, is because there is a narrative which is being formed, and it, and it was pushed, it was briefed to the Mail on Sunday, which, according to research, is the most Islamophobic newspaper in the country, consistently portraying Muslims in a very negative way, that disillusionment amongst uh, Muslims in Batley and Spen is being driven not by legitimate concerns, e.g., which is what I came up with, Palestine, Kashmir, but also general disillusionment with the weakness of the Labour Party and the Labour leadership, but by homophobia and anti-Semitism. Now, what's your, just tell me about what, and, and, and the allegations there, these were Galloway supporters. Now, I should just say, by the way, and I'll, I'll do this at the end because I want to spare Ollie having to listen to this rant. There's a 
conspiracy theory being pushed by so-called centrists and moderates that I'm a Galloway supporter because I interviewed him, uh, in which I focused on him voting for the Conservatives, for the Brexit Party, and him ranting about BLM. George Galloway's a man I have nothing but contempt for, and vice versa. But that this was portrayed as Galloway supporters, and therefore this is indicative of a homophobic campaign, and that's why Muslims are voting. What's your take on what happened and, and that whole narrative? Yeah, I mean, just also, you know, I have experienced, by virtue of being in situ at that place when it happened, I have also experienced the, you're like pandering to Galloway uh, flack. Uh, it's quite laughable, to be honest with you. But anyway, we're in Batley and Spen. Um, we had been following the Galloway campaign um, to report on sort of what he's doing, the way he's campaigning to Muslims in the constituency and how that might actually potentially be enough to knock knock the knock the Labour candidate off. Um, we pull up to this mosque. We've been with him for about an hour beforehand. We've been to a bed factory and another mosque. And then we came to this one, the Medina Masjid. Uh, Kim Leadbeat is there. We jump out the car. We go to try and interview her. Uh, they don't want to. They don't want us to speak to her. So we're just kind of hanging around. And then this guy comes up the road, uh, Shaquille, who you mentioned, and he starts haranguing her, harassing her. And initially, the way it starts is it's pretty sort of, I don't know if uh, the right word for it is sort of genial, but he's basically just asking her about Kashmir, um, trying to ask her about Kashmir. He can't really get his words out. It's obviously like quite an adrenaline-soaked situation, so it doesn't really make very much sense. He won't really let Kim speak. Um, Naz Shah is also there. She tries she tries to speak to him. He's not really interested. And quite quickly, you, you understand that he's basically just there to shout at her, um, to to film it and then post it on social media and hopefully, you know, get, get some views for himself and build, build his following or whatever. It's, it's basically just like a sting. Um, the commotion attracts the journalists who are in attendance. So that's GB News, Us, Byline TV and Reuters. And then once Kim finishes, uh, finishes addressing him and leaves, he follows her and the associated pack of journalists also follow her and it, chaser not us i should say we didn't do that um during this melee and the rush to the car his line of questioning then becomes increasingly ropey he describes he describes teaching teaching children about lgbt relationships as sort of sexually sensitive um which is again kind of rogue and i think belies a prejudice and then once Kim is sort of in the car. He then starts shouting, we will chase Labour, we will chase Labour, wherever they are or something like that. And yeah, they drive off. The media dissipates and we kind of hang around and start mopping up what's happening. And we then see Shaquille sort of down towards the, the gates of the Medina Masjid. He sort of stood on, stood on top of a, a pillar, um, shouting at worshippers as they're leaving the mosque. And he basically he's shouting words to the effect of don't vote for Labour, vote anyone but Labour. If you feel like there's someone you can vote for, vote for them, but don't vote for Labour. And whilst he's saying that, George Galloway has stood sort of maybe 10 metres away from him and he's pointing at him. So I think there's an ambiguity about whether Shaquille is, an, is a Galloway supporter or not. I don't think that's immediately obvious. Um, and then there's also kind of the ugliness of sort of electoral politics in this form, because... The reason Galloway stood at the gate of the mosque and Nash Shah is also there, as are some several other Labour campaigners. The worshippers are coming out and it's 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 I found it quite grim, to be honest. With you. I know it's been happening for a long time. It's the way politics is done in, often in places like this, all kinds of demographics. But it's basically like people leave people are leaving the mosque and it's just sticker, leaflet, sticker, leaflet. And it's almost like a production line. Um, it's quite grim in, in, in my view. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of the sequence of events. Um, and then we left um interviewed Galloway asked him about it um yeah and that's kind of that's kind of the the nuts and bolts of of what happened now this whole narrative what do you think of it this which is being promoted that the reasons for Muslim disillusionment with the Labour Party is driven by homophobia because of the, the sexuality of the Labour candidate and by anti-semitism which is the position being pushed by the Mail on Sunday in particular, I'm not going to name the journalist because he's just annoying, um, but also by uh, by a Labour source, which then the Labour leadership had to actually condemn on social media and disassociate themselves with. 
Uh, well, it's not what I found whilst I was there. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to be as vain as to suggest that because I didn't see it, it it's not real. But from the people I spoke to in Battling Spend, things there's there's two streams. There's local concern, which is potholes, literally, uh, mm -hmm. and transport were two big things that came up. There's also a police station that's closed down. Um, the nearest police station is about eight miles away, I believe. So you know, if there's a if there's a nine 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 call, there is a there is a wait for for the police to arrive. Uh, and then with the Muslim community and the people I spoke to, it's Palestine and Kashmir. Now, the Labour Party actually has or had positions on both of those things. I've been at Labour Party conference when the resolution on Kashmir was passed. And also when um, you, you, you'll remember it, Owen, I'm sure you were there with the Palestine flags in mm -hmm. the um, across the conference hall floor. Now, I believe there's a degree of disappointment with the way things have changed, um, or at least there's been less vocal support or, or even discussion of those issues in the last year. Um, and I think it speaks to the broader, broader malaise ineffectuality of the Labour Party right now. Because let, let's be let's be real, you know, talking about lead to here in in the street, right? There's no she doesn't have any security with her. There's there's a couple of canvases. Now I'm not suggesting that she should have a security guard all the time, but you know, in light of what happened, it takes one person with you know a degree of control to basically either usher her away or take that man away from her. That person's not there. The reason she has been involved in this confrontation is because Labour have put her in this seat. Now I'm not suggesting she doesn't have agency or that she doesn't want to do it, but Kim Ledbetter, she is not a long-term member of the Labour Party. She is not a long-term politico. She's not a special advisor. Bizarrely, actually, someone on the street suggested to me that a problem they had with Kim was that she didn't have a career in politics, which is not something you usually hear. Um, usually people are talking about the need for life experience, etc. cetera. Um, so Labour have put her in this position. And if something like this happens, I think there's a degree of responsibility that they have to bear. And just because the media captured it this time doesn't mean it hasn't happened before or she hasn't been harassed before in the street. And then again, I guess the follow up is that they're trying to they're then trying to spin spin what happened and use it for political gain, which I find, again, quite ugly and upsetting. And, you know, I, I realise in all the course of this that by by reporting on this in this way and kind of exposing that there isn't really, as far as I could see, an, a narrative like that or um, that it was as clear that, you know, Galloway is a terrible guy, which I think there's plenty of evidence to, to suggest that if you look at his politics, you can Google him that you know he's paid this agitator to attack kim no evidence for that whatsoever that kim is that, that that kim is a great person i don't think that's the case it's basically like you're on the campaign trail and what is largely basically just a stream of fairly chaotic events like materializes and it's quite ugly and unpleasant and then things dissipate and by reporting on that you're kind of inadvertently you know providing galloway with capital but you can't you can't that can't inform your reporting no. you have to you have you have you have to you have to cover what's happened you have to cover the truth of, of events and you know if you're not doing that then what's the fucking point i'm sorry i can i don't know if i can swear during it what, what is the point what is what is the point of doing your job hmm. like yeah just lastly then based on what you saw on the ground how do you think it's how do you think it's going to go do you have any sense of it and you know what do you think what do you think the political implications will be generally speaking political predictions are are for mugs oh and you know this as well as i do yep um i will <sighs> there is a set of circumstances in which george galloway could win that seat like that does exist if turnout is low and he's able to get out let's say between 10 and fifteen thousand votes uh there is real potential for him to win. I think the most likely outcome is he takes enough votes away from Labour for the Conservative candidate, Ryan Stevenson, to win, which would again be a master, another campaigning masterstroke by the Conservative Party, who have basically just run a telephone campaign, mm -hmm. uh, not really not really present on the ground, um, and have just allowed Galloway and Labour to tear chunks out of each other. Um, 
it's almost as if they're quite good at running and winning elections. Mm-hmm. Um, if that is the case, I don't you know, like it. Would, okay, historical precedent unheard of, no, no, hasn't happened post Second World War for two by election seats to be turned over from the opposition opposition to the government. Last time in a single term, single parliamentary term. I think the last time is like 1929 or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, significant. However, politics, like this is not politics as usual. Like it hasn't been pretty much since the referendum, right? There is a really significant realignment going on. If you can't see that from Cheshire and Amersham, where the Lib Dems overturned a 16,000 seat majority with a 25% swing, in what is previously considered like Tory heartland, and then Hartlepool, never been conservative in its history, potentially Batley and Spen. There is a realignment. There is no longer as strong a degree of partisanship from from voters. People are now prepared to vote for different parties, and the realignment is roughly along. It's uh, it's, it's less evident that it's along sort of the traditional lines of 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 Labour, and I don't mean that in the sense of the party. I mean in sort of um, profession, working working blocks class blocks and that the realignment seems now to be more based around things like culture values and identity um that certainly seems to be the case from 2019 does Keir Starmer go I that's it implicit implicitly the question you're asking me uh I don't know to be quite frank I don't know like for example it touches again on the on the on the stuff we were talking about with the Conservative Party. Pretty Patel hasn't gone. Hancock did eventually resign. Would Starmer resign? I'm not sure. It's only been a year in a pandemic, and like he always says, there's a mountain to climb. Um, so yeah, the one thing I would say, very very finally, I know you've overrun you, but you've got things you want to do today. The Conservative Party, the Conservative Party is very very good at killing off its leaders when they sense that things are going poorly for them, that they're not going to be able to win an election. Labour is not. And it's entirely possible that Starmer would just, will continue. I mean, because the first immediate question would be, who replaces him? Mm. Ollie, you've been an absolute champ. Thank you for, as I said, we we have overrun, but that's entirely my fault. So thank you so, so much for, as I've said, your, your your brilliant insights, not least on the ground of Batley and Spen. It's always always good to have journalists who, when pontificating about something, have actually actually gone and actually been on the ground and can speak on the basis of knowledge and experience. Um, but your your journalism is always fantastic. Do follow Ollie on Twitter. It's at Ollie Dugmore, D U G M O R E. Do give him a follow. Um, he's a great guy and always insightful. Really appreciate Ollie, and I owe you a pint. I was going to ask if you were going to buy me a pint like you offered to Ellie. So thanks for that. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're getting a pint, mate. Yeah, we're hanging Nothing out. Nothing if not fair. Nothing yeah, if not fair. That's socialism. Sure. <laughs> um, lots of love, mate. Have a good one and I'll, speak, I'll see you soon. Cheers, bro. Let's see. Um, I am just going to do a quick rant about the whole battery and spend thing quickly, by the way, because and I know some people who I'm friends with are a bit like, just let this slide. These people are idiots. They don't represent anything. But actually, and basically, and I think this is interesting because we hear, we've hear we heard a lot over the last few years about uh, misinformation being spread online, so-called fake news being spread uh, online, digitally and elsewhere. And I think there's actually, a, it's an important point to talk about. The people who often talk about it style themselves as moderates, as centrists, as liberals. And they will often claim that two extremes, whether it be left or right, Uh, are responsible uh, because they just put left and right in the same box and that's fine, that's political analysis. Uh, And and they're, for parties and ends, are pushing misinformation. Now, this week, ever since I interviewed, I I did a documentary in Batley and Spen in which I interviewed the Labour candidate, Kim Leadbeater, George Galloway, uh, Andy Burnham, as well as lots of people on the ground, uh, with a range of opinions, including Joe Cox's former parliamentary researcher, um, a range of opinions to have an honest understanding of what was going on. I approached the Conservative parliamentary candidate. He declined. He's turned down all journalists' requests. I also actually approached the Lib Dems. They didn't get back to me either. That's up to them. But I did my job. And what I did in the case of George Galloway is interviewed him, not least about his record in supporting the Conservative Party, which he voted for 
uh, after saying he'd prefer to gouge his eyes out. Uh, he voted for them on the basis of um, uh, tactical voting against the SNP. He also voted for the Brexit Party, um, having years before said he'll be vote he'll be voting for Remain like anyone with any brain cells would do, and denouncing Nigel Farage for blaming all of Britain's problems on Johnny Foreigner, and then campaigned alongside Nigel Farage. Now, I just want to quickly just just put a video up of George Galloway because he he is qu it's quite amusing, if anything. This is how he denounced me, and I'll explain why I'm putting this up. I had the dubious privilege of sitting down and having tea uh, with the loathsome Owen Jones of The Guardian this week. It wasn't the most pleasant couple of hours, although even he had to concede that, hey, I'm quite popular, actually, in the place where he was interviewing me. And I said to him, you are part of Labour's problem. In fact, quite a big part because you have led the way, you and people like you have led the way in the anathematization of the British working class because they don't think like you, talk like you, because they don't dress like you, because their social and cultural norms are not the same as you, you have blackguarded them. Um, why is it? It's a fascinating character. Fascinating character. Uh, d don't dress like you. I mean, most people don't sit around dressed in a Federer hat. Um, talk, I mean, I d talk like, if we're going to talk about how people talk, why does he speak like that? I've never heard anyone else enunciate in such an extraordinary way. Uh, I'm well known, of course, for demonizing the working class. Uh, my first book, of course, being entitled Chance, the Demonization of the Working Class. The, the point about that was, I mean, it's just, I mean, it is quite funny because he's such a ridiculous character in, in so many ways, um, is online because what happened was after the interview at this cafe, brilliant cafe, by the way, if you're in Batley, do go to it. Uh, and they gave me a chai. Oh, it's the best chai I've ever had. Chef's kisses and an iced latte. And they asked me to pose with the drinks after the interview, which I did. Turned out Galloway was in the background. They put it on their social media feed. And that's not been used to show that I pose with George Galloway. I'm a supporter of George Galloway. I'm his biggest fan, apparently. I'm a massive fan of George Galloway, who I blocked on Twitter about six years ago, uh, who I regard as a charlatan, a demagogue with deeply reactionary views on a whole range of issues. Notably, recently, trans rights. He's a massive transphobe. So transphobic, you'd almost expect a newspaper to give him a column. But the point is, is, this is being portrayed because I interviewed him. I did my job as a journalist that somehow I'm in cahoots with George Galloway. Now, what this shows is a lot of the people who supported Keir Starmer, not least when he departed from his promises in the leadership election, basically to be a more electable and professional version of Jeremy Corbyn, is it's all gone very wrong. It's fallen apart. He had Starmer, an easy ride from the media. He's not been called a massive terrorist supporter who hates his own country. Uh, every single day, uh, most of the parliamentary Labour Party have given him an easy ride. They haven't tried to coup him all the time. And it's all fallen apart. And they're angry. They're upset. They're confused. Why has it all gone so wrong? You know, this guy is so electable and, you know, so obviously mainstream and all the rest of it. The British public will come flocking to him. He's clearly more competent than Boris Johnson. Blah, blah, blah. And it's fallen apart. He's polling. Some of it is worse than Jeremy Corbyn was at this uh, time within his leadership, uh, even though there isn't a massive internal civil war and a massive media campaign against him. Uh, the polling is worse than Labour suffered in 2019 when they were, I think we'd all agree, routed pretty comprehensively. He's lost a seat, which Hartlepool, which Labour uh, kept in the 2019 inferno. He's in danger of losing another seat. Uh, the, the, the set, two by-elections in a row, an opposition losing to the government. Again, you have to go back to 1929. I won't go into the details there, but that's not even a valid comparison. Things have gone very badly wrong and they're angry and they want someone to blame. They don't want to blame themselves and their politics. They don't want to blame Keir Starmer because that would mean questioning his leadership. So instead, they're blaming people like me who are simultaneously irrelevant, which is how they've portrayed the left. Uh, irrelevant. No one listens to them they're, and all the rest of it. And we also have the power to swing a by-election by doing a video in which we interview one of the candidates. Equally, and this is what I'm just going to end with because this is far more dangerous and insidious, is... What I've just alluded to is a deliberate attempt to claim 
that British Muslim disillusionment with the Labour Party, as I've said, nearly nine out of 10 Muslims voted for the Labour Party in 2019, uh, an absolute pillar of Labour's electoral coalition. Many of them are disillusioned, like lots of non-Muslim voters are, and that's the point. Labour is not winning new voters compared to 2019, but it's actually losing existing voters who kept with them in the round of 2019. That's not good. They're going backwards. And they're attempting to, to, to portray Muslims, as I've said, as being driven not by legitimate considerations like Palestine and Kashmir, because the people who support Keir Starmer think that foreign policy issues are fringe issues that voters do not care about. They're just eccentric obsessions of the Labour Party membership. So they can't indulge that because that would mean conceding to a left-wing narrative. So instead, there's a narrative being built that this is homophobia and anti-Semitism. And that is why British Muslims aren't voting for the Labour Party. And what's so dangerous about that, of course, is a lot of the British media will happily go along with that because they are riddled with anti-Muslim bigotry and hatred. That is one thing which much of the British media has in common. Now, the consequences of that for factional purposes, so-called centrists and moderates, the sensibles, the grown-ups of British politics are prepared to throw one of the most oppressed and marginalised minorities in the country under a bus in order to protect their faction to ensure they stay in charge of the Labour Party. And that is disgusting. It's disgusting. And those people should be driven out of British politics. The idea that you would happily whip up bigotry and hatred against the minority that is relentlessly, every day almost, Hatred is whipped up against them by the British media. The idea you would indulge that narrative because you think that will protect your political faction and the leadership of your party makes you beneath the gutter because people will be spat at in the streets, they will be bullied, and they may well be attacked as a consequence because you will fuel this idea that British Muslims are a dangerous, bigoted enemy within who are backward and, and, and hate Jews and gay people and all the rest of it. And that's what's driving their disillusionment. You are disgusting people. I have nothing but contempt and revulsion for you. And you should be ashamed of what you are doing, including that Labour official who briefed to the Mail on Sunday, a violently racist publication, that this was because of Muslim anti-Semitism and homophobia. I can take your lies, and they are lies. No honest person could ever suggest that I support George Galloway, a man I loathe and vice versa. But when you try and weaponize bigotry against Muslims for your own political ends, you have vetoed any right to be accepted as someone in British politics who should be respected or treated as a legitimate political actor, you are an enemy and you will be defeated. And if, if it goes wrong for Labour and Batley and Spen, I would vote for Kim Leadbeater, by the way. I would vote for Labour as I've always done under every leader in my adult life. But that's irrelevant because Labour can't rely on people like me who will vote for Labour come what may, which I get criticised for on the left, incidentally. If it goes wrong for Labour and if anyone tries to use this narrative against British Muslims, those people should never, ever, ever be able to get away with it. They must face the consequences of trying to throw a minority under a bus for political ends for the rest of their lives. And that's all I've got to say about it, because I am angry about it. I'm very angry about it. I'm angry about how British Muslims are demonised in the British media all the time. And I'm angry that a desperate political faction who have a leadership which has no principles, which has collapsed in popularity, which has messed it all up, and now is looking for anyone else to blame for their own failures, those people have to take responsibility and not try and throw a minority under a bus. I've had my rant. I'm angry about it. And that's all I've got to say. We've got lots of interviews coming up during the week. Um, we'll have more coverage of what's going on, not, not just in Batley and Spen, but elsewhere. We'll cover the aftermath of the by-election and what it means for the Labour Party, which we will discuss, as you would expect us to do as a political channel. Um, we've got lots of documentaries coming up. We do rely on your support, um, including, I will thank everyone, including Lauren Kelly there, who supported us on Super Chat. Uh, if you're watching live, thank you so much. Uh, do like on YouTube if you're watching 
uh, and subscribe to our channel and do watch our documentary, including the interviews with George Galloway, Andy Burnham and Kim Ledbeater. Um, and uh, we will do lots more documentaries. If you support us on patreon.com forward slash unjoes84, that enables us to do those documentaries. They're very expensive and time consuming to make. You make them possible. We really appreciate your support. Do listen to us on the podcast. Uh, the podcast is doing extremely well, thanks to all of you. Let me just thank everyone who supported us on Super Chat during the show. John McKenzie, who's a regular, big fan of you, John. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh, Kieran Buckley, uh, Sean 1912, Tamara Law, D. F. Willow, John McKenzie again, uh, Gabrielle Matzu, uh, Gav Bailey, David Barata, who is a brilliant supporter of us on Patreon. We really do appreciate your support, uh, David S. Uh, Lauren Kelly. Thank you so much, everyone. Do, uh, as I've said, check out all of our videos. We've got loads of interviews, documentaries. We'll have lots more to come, including uh, a right-wing comedian, Jeff Norcott, who I've interviewed. We did promise we'd speak to people outside uh, of the... Oh, you'll probably now there'll be people saying I'm a big right-winger because I interviewed Jeff Norcott. Like all the time I've interviewed all those other... Right I'm support of the Brexit party because I interviewed them. I should stop. I am should not be too bitter about this. It is annoying, though. Um, cheers, everyone. Uh, we really do appreciate your support, as I've said, and have a great day, whatever you're doing. Lots of love. Speak to you soon.